Hello and welcome to this most recent episode of the Akkad and Coco Report. Today we have the pleasure of, of having Dr. Edward Lemer here. Dr. Edward Lemer is a professor of uh, economics. He served as the UCLA Anderson's uh, Chauncey J. Medbury Professor of Management and Professor of Economics, also Professor of Statistics and Director of the UCLA Anderson Business Forecast uh, Project. He's a Professor Emeritus and he is still still active in, in teaching uh, um, uh, as, well as, as well as research, uh, I understand. Um, Dr. Lemer is here because of the recent um, uh, interest that's been brewing in the use of uh, econometrics uh, in the field of medicine. Um, uh, you know, just last week, there was a New York Times article talking about what medicine can learn from economics, uh, specifically discussing uh, econometrics that we're going to get into. Um, Dr. Lemer um, is really uh, probably one of the... Uh, Certainly, uh, one of the one of the more well-known uh, economists that has kind of poked at uh, econometrics um, for some time, and um, you know I, he he came to my attention uh, about two years ago uh, when I found a paper that he had written. He had written a paper in 1983 um, that was titled "Let's uh, Let's Take the Con Out of Econometrics," and in that he detailed some of the um, some of the issues with econometrics at the time in the 1980s. And it, the paper was so good that it wasn't until 2010 that somebody even attempted to rebut him. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was, there were, uh, Angrist and Pishke in 2010 uh, wrote a rebuttal um, that was titled The Credibility Revolution in Empirical Economics, How Better Research Design is Taking the Con Out of Econometrics. And this, this paper kind of represents a, uh, a point at which I think we started to see more and more uh, analyses uh, from econometrics within medicine. Um, and, sp and specifically, uh, things like regression to discontinuity, instrumental va variables, natural experiments, and we'll, we'll get into some of that uh, 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 further. Um, but the, the issue that I, that, I, that I have Dr. Lima here to discuss is that the idea is that the randomized, randomized control trials um, which have kind of been the bedrock of uh, medicine for some time in terms of deciding whether or not uh, devices or drugs are uh, truly effective um, or not. Um, they, they, are, they are not the most efficient way of trying to get at um, whether or not something is, is uh, you know, whether a relation is truly causal or not. Um, sometimes these trials require, uh, are very expensive, they're very large, um, and sometimes you just can't do a randomized uh, control trial um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, and so the idea that is being proposed now by um, some pretty prominent members within medicine um, is that we should be learning from uh, 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 economics, the field of economics, the empirical world of economics, which is kind of titled uh, econometrics, um, to try to bring some of that over to medicine so we can arrive at you know, causal, causal inference, which is kind of the holy grail of a lot of stuff that we do. Um, so Dr. Lemur, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. Um, so start, start with, um, you know, back in 1983, when you wrote this original paper, what, what, what were, you know, what, what was going on at the time that, uh, you know, made you write this uh, initial kind of seminal work? Well, th this is uh, a saying in a, a, what I think is rather accessible language compared to what I'm going to use now. It's saying that the models that economists use are very high dimensional. They might fit a model with just a few variables, but lying behind that is nonlinear, lag values, non-normalities, all these things that you should be worrying about and do worry about sometimes. That makes the data set, uh, makes the dimensionality huge. And the way that you draw inferences, just one second. Ama, can you get these dogs out of here? The dogs are bothering me. No problem. <laughs> okay, I got to Just a second. Okay, here we go. I'm so sorry. That's okay. You're going to edit this, I hope. Yeah, huh? yeah, we'll edit. Not a big deal. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm being recorded here. Can you, can you get them out? Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's the basic problem that faces economists and medical scientists too. And whether you do randomized control trial or not, 
what lies behind the mo simple model that you run is a much higher dimensional model. In the case of, of clinical trials, you want to know whether that medicine works the same for all eight, all patients, male, female, old, young, uh, the Americas or Africa or Europe. I mean, there's huge numbers of other variables you could add in that interact with the treatment. And once that happens, then you start to overwhelm the data set. And the problem is you have to reduce the dimensionality. You have to reduce the number of questions you ask of the data. Otherwise, the data will say, I don't know. In other words, you put a whole bunch of variables in there, you're going to get big standard errors, <clears throat> a low T values, which is the data's way of saying, I can't answer all those questions. Ask me fewer questions. And that means to set up a simpler model with a fewer number of variables. And uh, <clears throat> what I was saying in the con and econometrics is we've hidden the larger model and we've hidden the reduced method of reduction that eliminated all those parameters and pretend as if they're not there. And that's the con and econometrics. We've got to be more honest about the dimensionality of the problem and then have a transparent, thoughtful way of reducing that dimensionality, a way that is compelling to the professional audience and to a more general audience as well. And I think uh, there's nothing harder than causal inference, by the way. Go ahead. So, and I think the idea was that, um, you know, you kind of don't know what's going, going on in the kitchen, if you will, uh, you know, so you have, you have a question, you have a data set, and you go into the kitchen and you do some, some, something which isn't, which is opaque to, 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 to most people, except for the researcher, and then you come out with some, 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 uh, some relatively easy answer. And so, you know, the, the reductionism that you kind of need so that the data can give you an answer that it's not obvious. It, it's not obvious to, to folks. Um, it, no, it's it, hidden. Yeah, right. It's, it's called, hidden. And now they, they, they give that the pejorative name p-hacking, right. meaning that you um, omit variables with low t-values, so the ones that remain have higher t-values. And that's considered a terrible thing to do. But for me, that's essential, because what you're doing is concentrating the limited data resource on a fewer questions that can be answered adequately by the data and the, the problem isn't that you did the p-hacking or concentration, it's that you left it non-transparent how you did, how big the model was and how you did that data reduction. So the idea was to make, uh, was ma to, was to make economics, which is, I mean, someone regarded, I mean, it's a, it's a social science, it's a, a softer science. It was to make it harder, make it, uh, you know, uh, make, make it kind of a hard science. Your feeling in 1983 was, we're certainly not there yet with what you're doing. Uh, would that be an accurate summary? Uh, way far away. In other words, if you do a sensitivity analysis to see whether minor changes in the model, this is what I was suggesting is the solution. You do a sensitivity model, sensitivity analysis, and there are some conclusions which are sturdy that don't depend on details of the model. There are others that are fragile. The vast majority of what economists claim that they see in the data is rather fragile, meaning that you see a slightly different model, you lead to another conclusion. And the con in econometrics is that we've hidden that fragility and we need to have a conversation about it and I, uh, be honest. My favorite quote, um, and this is because I'm a layperson medicine reading your, your, your paper, my favorite quote in your uh, uh, con econ econometrics, taking the con out of econometrics in 1983, my favorite quote in that is, was, um, uh, uh, methodology like sex is better demonstrated than discussed, <laughs> though often better anticipated than experienced. Yeah, that's true. That's and revealing then, something about me, I'm afraid. <laughs> accordingly. So then, and then you, you went on to give uh, an example. I don't want to put you on, 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 on the spot, but you went on to give a nice example about uh, capital, capital punishment. Um, yes. Correct. Do you, do you recall, uh, I'm sure you recall, uh, could, you, could you walk us through, you know, what, folks that concluded using, using econometrics and how you kind of reasonably They, they compared simply... different states right. of the United States and they looked right. at the murder rates and they found out the, that the states that had, um, I think it was, they had low rates of capital punishment that had the lowest um, uh, 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 murder rates. Right. And the problem with that is if you've got 50 states, there's dozens of variables that you can enter. Utah, for example, has a very low murder rate and a low um, uh, uh, 
uh, capital punishment rate. Well, you and I are thinking immediately, well, you, you tell us a little bit different. It's run by the Mormons. So you better put a Mormon variable in there and think about what, how culture is playing a role and the age. And, and you, you've got only 50 observations here. So it's very easy to add other variables, variables that you and I would regard as sensible and that ought to be in there. You add them in there and you find, you can find out that each time you, you uh, execute somebody, you cause another 10 murders or each time you execute somebody, you save seven murders, seven murders, prevent them. Because there's, that's a very fragile conclusion drawn from those uh, 50 states. So your proposal was, um, was to use um, uh, extreme bounds analysis, uh, you know, and you, this concept of fragility. Can you explain a little bit in terms of how, what you wanted economists to do rather than yeah. come up with these simple explanations and, you know, not kind of show people what variables you're emitting and whatnot? How, how did you think that economists should approach it at the time? Well, that, that, what, the extreme bounds can be described in a way that's mathematically obscure, but let's do it in a very simple way. Yes, please, for so us. So you, you have your one variable in the equation that you think of as is the focus of your work. You want to know what impact that has on the dependent variable. And you have, a, you have 10 other variables that you could include. And there could be different ways in which you select that 10. So I say, well, suppose that you chose the linear combination of those 10, that if you included that linear combination as a variable, then you get the biggest coefficient possible on your variable of interest. And you find the other linear combination that gives you the smallest estimate. That's the global sensitivity. You can't get outside the range. No matter how you play around with that, it's other variables. No matter how you reduce the dimensionality of that parameter space, you can't get outside of there. Typically, that is a very wide bound. Then that says you've got to be more thoughtful in the way you reduce 10 into one or 10 into two. You've got to think long and hard about which ones are more important and, how, and what the process is of, of eliminating them. But the global sensitivity analysis is hardly other do, ever done because that tells you that your conclusion is totally uh, fragile, totally. Right. And, and that's not and that's not what is going to get um, a lot of uh, traction, correct? If you come out saying that <laughs> your your your, right. your bounds of well, well, you know, this death penalty thing is interesting. We did this analysis, but it could be, it could not be. <laughs> that's not right. going to that's not going to that's not going to get on uh, NBC Nightly News. Um, yeah, that's true. I never got on NBC Nightly News. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're on the Cotton Coca Show for this reason. Okay, so. that's good. <laughs> um, the uh, so so that was you know that was 1983 um, and um, uh, as I said in, in my little monologue before that it was such a um, I would say um, incisive critique that uh, it took till 2010 for somebody to even begin to try to rebut it and uh, you know Angrist and and Prish do do you know these uh, yes I do uh, sure it's a small community uh, so Angrist and Pishke sorry um, correct. Uh, they um, they wrote a paper in 2010, kind of uh, kind of re responding to your critiques in, in a very nice, thoughtful way. Um, what and then they, what they basically described and said that look, we don't think we don't think extreme bounds, these sensitive analyses that Dr. Lemer suggested, we don't think that's that was the path to truth. We think that better research design uh, will 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 deal with some of the issues that Dr. Lemer brought up, and they specifically talked about pseudo-random experiments and regression discontinuity, instrumental variables. Can you, can you talk, can you summarize their, their points uh, for us in terms of what they felt? Well, uh, before we go to get to pseudo, oh, which is yes. a subjective uh, comment, let's talk about real randomized control trials. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, because that would lead to conclusions about the effects of treatments but in e economics, it's extremely hard to do those. You think about monetary policy or fiscal policy, there's no way there's gonna be randomized control trials for those, but even at, at the local level, e economics is supposed to be a social science, even though there's hardly anything in economic theory that has to do with social decision-making. But <clears throat> most of the policies you put in place, for example, trying to get people to do, get more education that is done within the context of a particular social system. And you're maybe having a potential impact on that social system over time. 
So to do that in a in a randomized controlled trial, in, in other words, it's it's what you learn in an economics laboratory may not really apply in the real world because they are so distinct and so different. Particularly when you think in medicine, you don't have to worry much about social consequences. You give a person the treatment and you don't think that treatment depends upon all, how many other neighbors got the treatment. That was it. But in economics, there is an important social consideration. So I, I'm a big, I like uh, randomized controlled trials. I think that's a good thing. Um, it, it, the, in economics, there's hardly any ability to control, by the way. So we do randomization, but usually you have a large list of controls and those, the failure to control can create the dimensionality, the, the parameterization dimensionality problem that we were talking about before. Because no matter, you know, if you have a hundred uh, randomized trials, but you have a hundred control variables, well, you, you're in what's called a, a, a data deficient setting in which you can't even do any estimation at all. So uh, that's what I said in that document is that um, whether you have uh, pseudo randomization or real randomization, there's still very serious problems of drawing uh, persuasive. I don't think truth is where we're going. If we're persuading, first of all, ourselves and other people. Uh, and it's very hard to do uh, persuasive inference in economics. And by the way, um, there's hardly anything that economics believe that is data dependent. It's almost all theoretical. Right, right. No, and that, that, that's, 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 that's an important point that I kind of skipped over is that certainly randomization by itself doesn't always give us, get, get us to where we want to be. And we know this in medicine very well. I mean, we do tons of RCTs and it's not like a randomized control trial has ever, <laughs> for, a, for, for anything that's remotely controversial has ever, an, has ever been a final answer, you know? Uh -huh. So, you know, there's so many different uh, issues that come up with RCTs that you've nicely laid out as well. So, so that, that's an excellent point kind of going against what Angus and Frischke said in terms of, um, hey, look, if we have these pseudo randomization natural experiments that exist, now we can come to causal inference. And your point would be that, hey, even, if, even, when, you have, even when we do RCTs, you know, causal inference isn't easy. Why do you think so, pseudo randomization would be easy? Is that so a quote, a quotation in that document is: "We are we should put away our mission accomplished banners. Right. We're never going to actually do that. We're going to make progress. We're going to persuade each other, but we're never going to get to the point where we really know the truthfulness of a complex uh, human system, like right. ec like an economic system." Right. So so what I mean so so you're not. What, what caution would you have to a, you know, a, a doctor who's practicing, um, uh, who, who's kind of barraged with some of these analyses? Um, uh, you know, because obviously it's, it's not framed the way you, I think, would like it. I mean, you, you described nicely in, 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 in one paper, um, uh, three-valued logic, right? Yeah, yes, that's true. Yes, no, or, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, and and we don't think of that. You know, that's certainly not the way academia seems to be structured. It's very much like, well, yes or no. That's um, econometrics. Right. Right. Same thing, yes or no. Right. Right. So, I, I, can I divert this a little bit? Because yes, I please. thought this conversation was going to be about machine learning. Oh, sure. And yeah. and you use the word econometrics, and the the difference is who's in control. Um, I I like to say that the worst two people to do a data analysis are a statistician who doesn't understand the, the context and a clinician that doesn't understand the statistics. And the ideal data analysis is done by somebody who's uh, are, are on the front lines, understand what the issues are, uh, what the clinical issues are, but also understands the complexities of, of scientific inference. And the problem with this machine learning stuff is it's it's done completely without context, without the clinician playing a role. So that to me rings out big alarm bells. When you use the word econometrics, econome econometricians are, who do data analysis make the choices themselves. They don't turn it over to machines to do it. Psychology has often used uh, um, the, the uh, algorithms which are omit variables with low T and then continue to do that repetitively. That's a 
early machine learning algorithm. And they've led, that's led them to all kinds of mistaken inferences because they didn't have the clinician who understood the context to draw, drive this thing. So I would say, first of all, to your physician friends, if, if somebody finds some kind of a, a causal mix, a, a, a mix of correlations that they claim is causal, you, you've got to hear the story that tells why that is really true. There has to be a compelling logic to that. It can't be just something that a machine uncovered. So uh, then you need to ask, have a clear sense of how this dimensionality problem has been resolved and led to this causal conclusion. So you, you use the word instrument as a way of determining a causal. I don't like that language because instrument sounds too scientific. I, I prefer to word, use the word surrogate. Sorry, yeah. So I cannot use a randomized control trial, but I'm going to use this variable as a surrogate. And then you and I are going to have a conversation about, is that really a surrogate? Is this the kind of, is this equivalent to the kind of intervention that I'd like to carry out? I mean, if you think about education, for example, education isn't taking a, uh, a, an aspirin. It's, a, it's something that is totally different for each individual. So if you say this, this particular variable is a surrogate for the education intervention that I have in mind, I can, we got to think long and hard about whether that works or not. And, uh, I, and so I, I think physicians need to be, uh, view this with uh, a doubtfulness. You know, the, the, the medieval doctors were divided into two groups. There were theorists and there, there were empirical types. And the second meaning of empirical is quacks. And empiric is a quack, <laughs> meaning that they didn't use any theory, I suppose. So I think you've got to be alert to uh, turning yourself into a quack if you just go with correlations and uh, econometrics without a compelling story. So that, was, that would be my alert. You need to, somebody comes in your office and say, I found the, the cure for COVID-19 by doing this observational data work and I use yada yada as a uh, randomized uh, treatment. You gotta listen to the story. That has to be a compelling story. So, or, so in other words, the bottom line is this. If, you, if you're trying to turn a, 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 a high dimensional set of correlations into a causal conclusion, that takes a story, and it takes a great story, a compelling story. So th and, those compelling stories are driven by, uh, I guess, bioplausibility. The, 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 the how plausible it is. Is that is that would that be fair? Or well, I, I like one the, component I, of it. I like the story of John Snow. Do you know this original epidemiologist with John Snow? No. He he discovered that um, there were two apartment buildings in apartments in. Um, London in, I don't know, 1880s, I guess. And one was uh, fed by one well and the other one was fed by another well. Or the, first he discovered that the one apartment was full of cholera victims and the other one didn't have cholera victims. So he's thinking, I wonder why that is. That's weird. And he discovers that one has, is, is uh, they get their water from one well and the other from the other, other well. And this was an era in which there were two kinds of theories of medicine. There was a miasma theory which is the, it's the atmosphere, and they would shoot cannons into the air in order to clear the atmosphere. Uh, and it was a murky atmosphere that caused the cholera. The other was the infection story, that being too close to other individuals would cause infection. So neither one of those uh, fit with this discovery of, the, of water as a source of cholera epidemic, and snow was ignored. So he needed a story, he needed a germ story that would make the, his correlation meaningful. And he didn't have it. The other one is Semmelweis, by the way, that I like to use too. The Semmelweis was a French physician who discovered that the doctors who washed their hands in a chlorine yeah. solution before, child, before giving childbirth, administering childbirth, they had much lower maternal death rates. And he couldn't convince his colleagues that that made any sense because it wasn't a story. It was only a correlation. And he ended up in an insane asylum. I don't know if it was a causal event there or not. But <laughs> <laughs> so that's so that's so interesting. So the so I mean, what you're describing is not. I mean, the path to to to, to causal inference then isn't a different research design study or something 
some you know uh, least squares or some some regression analysis or whatnot. It's not machine learning. <laughs> the path is really finding that you know finding that 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 story that connects. Um, you know what's happening, and that that's only done. You know, I guess in the, in the lab, right? That's 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 experimental type type knowledge that you have to kind of. Uh, no, I don't think that's, that's that's non-experimental. Is oh, non-experimental. Okay. Yeah, in, in experiment, you can have controlled uh, oh, I see. trials, and but if you without those controlled trials, it's a it's a matter of judgment of of whether that correlation matrix. And only only a physician can kind of, I guess, in that particular case, try to connect the the, the two things. But how how does how but, do? But I no, I think that physician yeah. needs to have a statistician talking with him, and say this is what you need to assume, you need to have this level of belief and this assumption, mm-hmm. in order to draw this conclusion. Does this fit with your clinical experience? And right. what do you think about this assumption? There needs to be a conversation. That's the, that that's what creates the context. Right. So the problem with machine learning is it's completely context-free. It needs to have a front end that defines the context. Mm. And that, mm. that has to be a conversation between the computer and the clinician to find out what the computer might do with the data set that's about ready to explore. Right, right. And, and of course, the problem comes frequently is that, you know, sometimes, I mean, for I mean, just as the examples you described, um, if, you, if, if, if it's unknown at the time, if technology hasn't gotten to the point that you can you can demonstrate cholera in, in water or, or whatnot, right? Um, uh, you, you, you're in a, you're in a, uh, you know, the, you're in a fog of uncertainty and, um, you know, there's just, there's just no way, you know, there's just no way around that because a lot of times we use statistics and we use a variety of different thing, a variety of different methods to, uh, to say that the, the correlation here is so good. Um, even though we don't know the exact, story we think we think the connection is strong and we're kind of gonna we're gonna go go with that but um part of this is decision making in when you have a lot of uncertainty and certainly covid you know which is a novel pathogen which physicians haven't experienced certainly at this scale um you know it really exposed exposed uh, you know exposes a ton a lot of that so um it's been it's been interesting to see how decisions are made in that context so my impression is that the public health authorities are pretty much like economists that rely mostly on models. So how do they, what's the evidential basis that uh, going to the beach is uh, dangerous? Or all these things that they expound about, wearing masks, for example. I don't, I don't question that it has an impact, but I'm just saying that the, the evidence is pretty minimal. And they have these models that project the death rates and infection rates going forward. That just screams out to me economics this is what we do without any clear evidential basis for the conclusion but again what what would you you know so you know, you you get into this panic right we have to do something and so how do you how do you how do you convince the populace to do something without some pretty sharp and some pretty model some study that says with with you know fake strong confidence that this is what we must do um you know i don't know but more, this is the same thing with global warming for example yeah. we don't have ex- experiments we don't have randomized controlled trials for this and it's the models that uh, that are being used by the scientists in that area that create these forecasts and i don't i'm not questioning the models i'm just saying it's model-based evidence not model-based decision making and not evidence-based it'd be ideal to have evidence-based for most of this stuff right 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 right. no that's great so uh, how how have you in general felt um uh, since since the 1980 article, since since 2010, since you know advances in research design that uh, that many of your colleagues talk about, um, uh, do you feel like uh, things are better now than they were, you know, three decades ago? Well, when I was a young academic, I used to worry that people would steal my ideas, <laughs> and as I grew older, I realized that the real problem is being ignored altogether. <laughs> <laughs> so they meaning that that economists continue to have their their conversations based inappropriately on the on the subtleties of drawing inferences in complex settings. Can you can you can you point to some some large problems that have resulted from making um making these type of inferences in the economics world? Uh, I, I know you mentioned them you mentioned some, but uh, just just to give us a sense of how bad things can get if we, you know, rely too heavily on 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 these analyses. 
Well, the, the PISCI work has uh, tried to identify the, the value of an extra year of education and the, what they call the instrument, what I would call a surrogate, is, is the year month of birth. And, appa and apparently that has an impact on how many years of education you have. Because if you're the oldest kid in the classroom, I think maybe you get an extra year of education. So then, that, then they study how much more those people who have that extra year because of their birth order, which is a so-called random treatment, how much more income they earn. So I said, so that's a surrogate for random treatment. I said, you know, that the biggest kid in the classroom isn't, it's not, he's, the, he's winning that relationship with all of his peers. It isn't that, uh, it isn't that he got an extra a year of education. He got an extra year because he's the biggest kid in the classroom. So this isn't a measure of, of it, the extra impact of an extra year. Can, so anyway, can, whatever the instrument is, there's going to have to be a discussion right. about is this is this equivalent to uh, you sitting down with your children and encouraging them to have an extra year of education? Is is picking the month of birth equivalent to you sitting down? I think not. Right, right. Are, are there are, are there large? Um, you know, a lot of this is is this stay in the academic realm and doesn't really affect us in the real world um are there are there examples where we've kind of gone really wrong on a policy front uh, nationally because of because of um, you know uh, being led astray by inappropriate economic analyses well uh, uh, fiscal and monetary policy is completely conducted without much evidential basis the amazing thing to me is after the 2008-2009 uh, downturn the uh, federal government put in place all this fiscal policy, the Obama stimulus right. packages. And uh, <clears throat> so two groups of, of prominent economists, one signed a document that said, this fiscal policy is really dumb and I can't imagine anyone to consider it. Another one said, it was so great that you did this fiscal <laughs> policy. And, and the reason is they belong to different religions, religious sects within the economics area. And those sects are hardly moved by any actual evidence. Oh, fascinating. Um, what what do you see going forward in in economics? Uh, are, are we going to uh, are we going to have to wait for uh, you to be uh, you know posthumously? <laughs> or what, when will people see reason again, Doctor Lieber? I don't know. I think it's, we're in for more of the same, but definitely, whether I'm here or not, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Lieber, thanks thanks so much. I think I think it was really uh, wonderful. I'm going to link to. Um, the various articles um, that, that you've written and the, and the Angus and Prisca article as well. But, but, but the lesson, you know, that you would have, I, I think I'm getting just, just to, just to make sure we're summarizing it a little bit um, is that, is that context is incredibly important. Certainly as clinicians, the context that we provide from being on the front lines and, 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 and kind of the connections that we've experienced and made over the X number of years that we've been practicing uh, those aren't overwritten by some machine language, uh, machine learning uh, uh, correlation that says, no, this is the way the world is. Um, you know, we, we probably do understand a lot about the world, how the world is uh, based on our experience. And that context is invaluable in kind of informing, informing research. Um, and the other, I guess the other aspect is that, um, w w do you think that we need to, we need to, when research is published, should, should, should folks be a lot more humble in terms of what the possibilities are? Um, yeah, definitely. Humility, uh, three-valued logic. We have to understand mostly we're in the don't know. And uh, maybe we're on the edge of no, on the edge of don't know. But don't, don't know is the prominent position that we're in. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the, thank you for the words of caution. I hope, I hope uh, clinicians and physicians who are listening uh, kind of uh, take, take, the, take these words from, uh, from you to heart. So thanks. Again, I enjoyed Dr. you Lieber. very much. So I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, one, wonderful to talk to you. You're, you're, you're I'm a big fan. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks so much.